evening. After Phil spoke on hope last week, I thought I could speak on faith, although that's kind of backwards, right? It's supposed to be faith, hope, and love. I was going to sign the next day up for love. Um, obviously, I won't really cover everything there is on faith, which folks has three points. So I came up with three points on faith that it changes your perspective, that it unifies us, and that it motivates us. Those were the three things I wanted to talk about. First, looking at a Roman centurion mentioned in Matthew chapter 8. It says, When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And a leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, willing you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go, show yourself to the priest, and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, keen observers will note that in this particular story, there is no centurion. But it still felt relevant to me because this guy came to Jesus. And I looked back on the history before this, I'm like, why did the centurion think that he could come to Jesus in the first place for healing? And that is what people did. He said, as Jesus was starting his, his ministry, then you saw where large numbers of people were bringing their ill to Jesus, and then he would heal them. And highlighting there that the leper came to him. And out of Matthew 4 was the previous verse where, where it mentions that they brought to him all that were ill. So then when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. There's no, no precedent for doing it like this. Everyone before this brought the sick person to Jesus, where this centurion seems to have convinced himself that he doesn't need to, that he can leave the sick guy at home and just kind of come on his own to make his request to Jesus. Kind of curious and different that he should do something like this. So sort of following the model of like Jesus have, has to be with the sick person, then Jesus says, I will come and heal him. But then Centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. So why does he do this? Why, why is the Centurion different? And he says, For I also am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my slave, Do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. And I wanted to get down to the end of the story, but I wanted to go back and focus on this part some. That the centurion says, well, I'm a man under authority. So the centurion, in think, hearing about Jesus and thinking about him, he's decided that Jesus isn't just some guy that has power. Or something because you can do sometimes sorry you can do things sometimes without having the authority to do them right you can steal things you can go in and take that thing even though it's not yours and take it out without the authority to do that but the centurion seems to realize something more that Jesus doesn't just have the power to heal illnesses to, to fix people that are paralyzed or whatever he has authority over your health. He has authority over illness to tell those things to be gone, to, 
to make your body be right. And the centurion says to himself, well, I know how authority works. You don't have to be there. Why why get all these people? I'm, I'm sure a centurion could find someone to the commander of the hundred, right? Whether it be using the soldiers or he could find some friends or something, he could get the servants there. But he says, I don't need to do that. I understand how authority works. Jesus can just say it and it will be done. And it's kind of a neat display of, of his faith. And Jesus cares. When Jesus heard this, he marveled. Using and expressing your faith is something appreciated. I think still going on, um, some about authority. In Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So something more on, on your perspective. Linked, linked, obviously, to authority. But if you're ever wondering, like, why are we here? What is my life about? What am I supposed to be doing? Well, you were made by Jesus and for Jesus, through Jesus. So if he's designed you for some kind of purpose, and that purpose is ultimately to serve him, that's probably how you're going to work best. Many of you know that some months ago I had a little incident with a hatchet. Where I wasn't using the hatchet for its intended purpose. I'd used the hatchet many times for its intended purpose or, or something like that and had no problems with it whatsoever. But when I used it for something beyond its intended purpose, that did not go well. That, that turned out very badly. Later, I got the right tool and, and put it to that purpose and, and things went just fine. When, if you're struggling along in your life, things don't seem to be going right, Maybe you're not following the right purpose for you. Maybe you need to follow the purpose for him rather than yourself. He is also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, what wrath? Sometimes the words just don't work right. I say, whether are things on earth or things in heaven. Love reading about how awesome Jesus is sometimes. On that same topic, more. God after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. We probably could have a whole sermon just on this chapter, right? And just on how awesome Jesus is. And I, I just picked like these four verses as sort of a highlight to me of, of some of my favorite parts of this particular chapter and highlighted some of the more awesome phrases, at least in my view, of talking about Jesus and how wonderful he is, he is. To be the radiance of God's glory. To be the exact representation of his nature. To have power that can uphold all things. He's 
incredible. That he could make purification of sin. If you've noticed, but that's a lot of sin. To be able to make purification for all of them? To be at the right hand of the majesty on high. If, if that doesn't change your perspective, son, to have faith in a God like that, to have faith in a Christ like that, what is it that, that you consider beautiful here on earth? What is it that you consider awesome or that you consider desirable, that you're saving this money for maybe, or you're working hard to get? How much does it pale in comparison to him? More on, on the majesty of God, this time out of Isaiah chapter 6. Again, just kind of looking at the first four verses there. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. I don't know if, like me, you've gone out and tried to damage your hearing at some of these rock concerts where they play just thunderously loud music or something, where you can feel the, the beat of the bass in your sternum. But to feel the foundation of the threshold tremble at the sound of his voice. That is some incredible, powerful voice. So, so I think that faith should change your perspective. That it should demand in you some respect for his authority. That it should help give you some purpose, help you understand the purpose for your life and, and what your life should really be about. I think that it should set the standard, set a very high bar indeed for beauty, for majesty, for truly awesome things. Maybe kind of help us let go of some of the things that we pursue here that we're sometimes so eager to cling to. Put them in right perspective and make it a little easier to share those things and focus instead on the relationship with Him. But you need three points, right? So, faith unified. Out of Ephesians 4 1 through 6. Therefore, I. The prisoner of the Lord implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. It's kind of somewhat famous passage, I think, um, just with all, all the ones, seven ones that pop up in here. I found it easier to remember what all the ones were when I started breaking them down into subsections. I think that there are three aspects of God there, in saying one Spirit, one Lord, one God and Father. So, and one hope, one faith, one baptism. I'm not going to say that's all of salvation, but three aspects, anyway, of salvation. The important ones are that. And those two different three, three aspects of God and three aspects of salvation, uniting the one body. And obviously for this sermon, one faith is, is some part of that thing that's supposed to help unite all of us. This last little phrase, who's over all and through all and in all, helps put me in mind of Christ's prayer for unity. Uh, John 17. Some of 
with this guy. Almost confusing me with the different relations of unity. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who also believe in me through their word. Believe is highlighted there because that in the Greek is the same root word as faith. That faith, saying that you're faithing doesn't work as well, but you can believe in him. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which sorry, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and loved them, even as you have loved me. It is true, definitely, that Unity is not especially easy. It, I can argue with myself sometimes. So how am I supposed to have the same opinion on everything as, as everyone else here? Um, but then it glorifies God that much more when we can't make that work. When people are coming to see the unity that we have, like, why are they doing that? It's not all about us. It's all about them. And Peter, sitting to him, right on the same idea of First Peter 1. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls, for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. And there, right after he talks about faith and hope, again, he uh, seems to trigger him, we need to talk about unity, we need to talk about love for one another. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. So, again, faith Help, faith helps bring us together. Paul, Jesus, and Peter, we read here, and others, I think, spoke of faith and unity as these connected concepts. So, like I said, three points. A living faith acts. Now, James 2. I'm sure you're familiar with this passage, but what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no work? And that faith saves him. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. A living faith is going to be something that is going to drive you to action. Faith in Jesus, faith in His majesty, faith in His commands. When you see your, your brother or your sister in need, you're going to be moved. You're going to feel that connection to them, that unity driving you to action to help them out in a substantial way. Not just saying, go in peace, be warm, be filled. And probably wouldn't be complete if you didn't go to Hebrews 11, right? So faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. What follows after that is kind of just a long list of people who took action. They, they didn't just believe in God and then just kind of go about their normal everyday life doing whatever happened to occur to them or what seemed good that day, but they took action by faith. And often, not especially easier action. It's been said many times, well, that's easier said than done because you propose some some plan of action and it's like, well, yeah, okay, that sounds like a nice idea, but it's tough to do. It turns out almost everything 
is actually easier said than done. I, I can say, I walk to the back of the room more quickly and easily than I can actually walk to the back of the, back of the room. Everything requires some motivation. Everything requires something to drive you to actually go take that action. And this, this was my favorite example, but there's actually many in that chapter. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Vegetales did a great job of depicting this, actually, showing the, the different vegetables kind of marching around the city as the peas grow proceeds and things at them. But they said, like, why are you doing it? The peas on top would say, why are you doing it this way? Why are you marching around our city? And the response was, our God told us to do it this way. It's kind of simply like, no, it doesn't make sense to us. No, it's not how we would choose to do it. Actually, some of the more logical things is there, but the Walman, Walmanator 2000 is there. Um, but they did it that way because God told them to do it that way. And that, that is something else that, that faith does when it drives us to action. To not necessarily do our choice of action, not do things our way, but to do things His way and count it, that it will work out. One last thing. Faith defines the rules of the Lord. When we go to action, we can't just necessarily go to whatever action and do whatever we want. I think sometimes the phrase is that anything goes in times of war or whatever, that you can just go to whatever you, length you need try and win that war. After all, it's a matter of life and death. We have to win. It's a war. But there's a lot of rules given. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. There were lots of passages, of course, talking about different rules, but this verse in particular is supposed to mean, be angry. Because Anger does often motivate us to some kind of action, right? And yet, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. There's plenty of cases, like I say, where you're, you're angry. You're going to go out and you're going to take action. You can't just kind of take whatever action you want. You have to be limited. I think the United States military is the best trained military in the world. Some awesome, wonderful soldiers out there doing great, great things. And what I've heard about them is that they also are limited in how they do things. I heard a story of a couple guys saw back in Iraq where IEDs were a big issue there for a while. Saw uh, apparently a father and his son out the side of the road, a ways away from their base, bringing an IED by the side of the road. And the grunt, who didn't quite get it yet, was saying, oh, good. Shoot the son, or shoot the father, shoot one of them while the other one's watching so that he sees and dies. Ha ha. So it shows him. And the commander, who gets it, says, no, we're going to go capture them and take them in. Because you don't know whether the guy is being blackmailed by someone else into, or being forced into doing this. You don't know that that guy out there is necessarily in doing this of his own choice. Necessarily. Maybe he's being kind of forced. So we're going to be nice. We're going to follow our rules not be like, not follow their rules, you're going to do it the right way. Just because you're going to war doesn't mean you have to give up all the basics and all the training. So follow the rules. So, faith motivates us. Faith drives us forward. A living faith will act. 
our living faith will convince us, will convince us of right and wrong and that here's a situation that needs to be fixed, needs to be addressed. But it also defines and follows the rule of the of the war. That did not find it. Someone told me that about your sermon, about your speech, you should tell them what you're what you'll tell them. So we had that slide earlier, and then you tell them. And then you tell them what you told them. So faith changes your perspective because it demands respect for his authority, gives us purpose, and defines the reason. Faith unifies us. It's written by Paul, Jesus, and Peter, as, and many others, connecting faith and unity. And then now it's supposed to come up. The faith motivates us. A living faith acts it convinces us to act, and it defines the rules of war. Also, this does, as we spoke on this morning, um, spur you forward some, encourage you to better live out your faith, to be driven towards God, to act, but also all of that will follow Him in the right perspective. If you're stepping forward in your faith, you need to renew your faith, you want to come, come forward perhaps to ask for the congregation's help or just begin your walk with God, you're definitely invited to do so. We stand and sing our